But we begin with an important update on the Elian Gonzalez custody clash. I'm going to introduce to you Dr. Mitch Spiro. A child and family psychologist, Dr. Mitchell Spiro. What did he think? Psychologist Mitch Spiro evaluated him earlier this month. He's here with the permission of Elian's relatives. Dr. Mitch Spiro, a child psychologist, joins us live now from our Fort Lauderdale newsroom. Licensed psychologist Mitch Spiro says with these games becoming more violent, Doc Talk expert child psychologist Mitch Spiro. Dr. Mitch Spiro counsels kids on how to deal with bullies, and he says it's an issue as serious as drugs and alcohol. Child psychologist Mitch Spiro says sleep is crucial for kids. Child psychologist Mitch Spiro says you should be concerned if you notice sudden behavioral changes. A licensed psychologist for almost 20 years, Dr. Spiro frequently works with teens, many of whom have taken Xanax. That was a, that was a statement from a man identified as Mitch Spiro, a licensed psychologist who is the pro bono evaluating psychologist of six-year-old Elian Gonzalez. He says the six-year-old has been traumatized beyond belief, losing his mother and stepfather, and is in fear of being reunited with his father, and it is important not to yank him from the stability of his great aunt, his uncle, and his cousin. We now rejoin Larry King in progress. And a proper dosage. Any medication that's taken without prescription can be harmful. A characterization which includes the drug Xanax, most commonly used for treatment of anxiety. It is prescription only, not over the counter. Still, in recent years, it has become one of the drugs of choice for adolescents who abuse it. It helps them from their perspective to relax. Um, combined with alcohol that is a depressant can have very serious effects. The most severe results, say doctors, death. In Philadelphia recently, 28 teenagers took Xanax during school. 12 had to be treated at a hospital. And just last week in Houston, four students were rushed to the hospital after taking Xanax at a middle school. A licensed psychologist for almost 20 years, Dr. Spiro frequently works with teens, many of whom have taken Xanax. He says most get their hands on the drug, sometimes referred to as Xannies, from their parents' medicine cabinets or from friends who got the drug the same way. His youngest client known to have used Xanax, only 13. As a father and a doctor, it's somewhat overwhelming at times because it's a very sad situation that our teenagers are putting themselves at risk to this level. The following is produced by Five Star Productions USA, which is solely responsible for its editorial content. monitor everything our children watch on television. I mean, you can't be everywhere at once. There is one way, however, that assures you that what they're watching is something you've already approved. Childhood is a time of rapid growth and development. Research has shown that during these critical first years, hands-on play experiences are vital to learning. The process is essential to later success in more complex tasks. Learning for kids is so simple that it's tempting to pass it off as merely recreation instead of recognizing it as what it really is, a child's effort to build an understanding of the world. Brain development happens most rapidly during the first few years of life. During this time, watching TV or playing video games doesn't nurture the same conceptual and psychological growth as that developed through self-motivated play. Children engaged in passive activities like TV are using other people's images and ideas instead of coming up with their own. Experts say that a good toy is 90% child and 10% toy. Toys that perform completely on their own don't allow kids to contribute their own ideas and imagination. Parents should think of imagination as a muscle. If it's not exercised, it will atrophy. Unstructured fantasy can be acting out of different scenarios. 
some that create anxiety with a successful resolution, others that are just ways of learning to understand social interaction. Pretend play helps kids become more comfortable with the give and take of relationships. The challenge of deciding who has which role and what happens fosters sharing, cooperation, and compromise. Imagining there's someone or somewhere else is a safe way for children to make sense of the world around them. In the act of play, children can be anyone they choose, whether it be a rescue hero, a superhero, a fireman, or a policeman, or even a teacher. They assume the role of the authority figure and understand the whole process of social interaction. Play Hut, as other toys do, of an unstructured nature, allow us to act out and play and to interact in a whole different way than a game that has rules. Parents also appreciate Play Hut's Easy Twist technology, which allows for easy setup, storage, and portability. The wide variety of play boxes, tunnels, and tents can be connected, so a child can build his own imaginary play town. Kids can create a clubhouse, castle, tea room, pirate ship, whatever a game of make-believe demands. They're sturdy enough to set up in the backyard, at the beach, or campground and they're easy to fold up into a small size for carrying and storing. Your child's make-believe can seem truly magical when you view it as a window into his innermost thoughts and feelings. From that vantage point, imagination can be a learning tool for both parents and children. One of the most valuable things parents can do is understand why their children pretend play and treasure their ability to do so. we're always looking for ways to help our children grow and learn. Here are some fun ideas that will enhance your family's home life while helping your children develop real life responsibilities. As parents, what we say and do today will shape our children's minds for the future. It is our responsibility to ensure that our children develop positive real life skills. One of the simplest and most effective ways to develop a young mind is through family interaction. Just being included in everyday decisions and activities not only helps your child develop, but also encourages greater family bonding. In the field of clinical psychology, we look to researchers that have helped us to understand the development of human needs. Schutz spoke of the need to be included, Maslow to feel a sense of belonging, and Adler to feel significant and secure. One easy way to encourage your children's development is by including them in your interior design decisions and by making sure that common family areas incorporate their needs as well as yours. After all, it's their home too. One of the most important rooms in a house is the living room, another may be the study. The rooms that children and adults interact. When a child can be a part of what an adult is doing, it makes them feel as though they belong and they're included. For example, a desk that has a drawer just for a child, when a parent's doing paperwork, makes them feel significant. One tip is to look for furniture features that are family friendly. For example, IKEA offers home furnishing solutions that take into consideration every member of the family, not just the grown-up. Little things like easy to reach drawers and personal storage units are designed to help give kids small responsibilities that can pay big dividends in their development. At IKEA, children are the most important people in the world, so we strive to design products that not only help children develop through play, but also interact with their families. And in our store, our model homes depict various life situations to offer some great design solutions for families. We also have many family-friendly features in the store, like special kids' menus and special play areas, so that the shopping experience at IKEA is a fun and enjoyable one for everybody. Letting your kids take part in the design of your family living spaces teaches them real skills by encouraging them to interact with other family members and develop responsibilities. But perhaps the biggest bonus 
is that when we make decisions as a family, it brings us closer together and gives us greater respect for one another. Teaching kids how to be grown-ups begins at home. And what better way to show them what it means to be an adult than teaching them the responsibilities of organizing a home. Positive Parenting. I'm your host, Dr. Paul Layden, and tonight we'll be bringing you an interesting topic that many of you will be interested in calling, perhaps, and talking to us on Teenage Rebellion. This is a live call-in show for all of you who are viewing us now. I want to remind you from time to time throughout the show that you can call in through any, for, at any time. The number is 995-2174 if you have any questions for myself or any of my guests. Tonight's topic, Teenage Rebellion, something that most of you who are viewing us are familiar with if you have been through it in your own lives or if you have children now who are in their teenage years and may be experiencing some of that rebellion. Tonight we'll be trying to understand some of the dynamics behind that, why it is teenagers go through this stage. Is it a stage that all teenagers go through? Can it be avoided? How should parents respond to it? and what, what can be done. Tonight with me on this show will be two guests. First of all, I'd like to introduce Dr. Steve Moskowitz, a psychiatrist who has a private practice in Coral Springs, who is also the director of the adolescent unit at University Pavilion Hospital in Broward County. Welcome, Dr. Moskowitz. Glad to have you on the show. Also with us will be Dr. Mitchell Sparrow, a psychologist in private practice in Plantation who has also had extensive experience with adolescents. Welcome to the show, Mitchell. Glad to have you here with us. Glad to be here. One of the things that I think I'd like to bring up first of all is a discussion of what it is that happens in the teenage years. I'd like to ask you first, Dr. Moskowitz, is teenage rebellion a normal process? Is, what is behind it? Is it something that happens automatically as a child enters puberty? Is it something hormonal, something chemical? Is it a function of family dynamics? What, what are some of the forces th behind it that cause this to happen so that our parents who are watching can, help, can understand a little bit more about why their teenagers may suddenly behave very differently? I think it's all of those things that you mentioned. And yes, uh, teenage rebellion is normal. I think what's important for parents to understand is uh, when it sort of gets off the track, uh, when uh, rebellion is something that is to be tolerated and to what degree. Example, I think that uh, there are certain uh, growth stages, developmental stages that we all go through. We start as uh, tiny infants, we become small children, and then as we get to the teenage years, that is the beginnings of starting to become an individual, a separate person that is starting to separate from one's uh, family of origin, mm -hmm. from one's birth family or from the family that raised one, the psychological family. Um, that's how the rebellion starts, maybe by sh starting to show some signs of independence, developing your own ideas, your own thoughts. Uh, so it's the very nature of becoming a separate individual uh, may create conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, you may start to go against some of the ideas of your of your family. Sure. And this may be seen as a problem, mm -hmm. but in itself may be also a normal process. For years and years, a child has been a child, and the parents have been the ones who have been dictating what the child should do and how they should behave and how they should eat, dress, sleep, and, and whose friends are the right friends to hang mm -hmm. around with. And then at 12, 13, 14 years old, the child suddenly realizes that they can make their own decisions and they seem to strive for that independence. 
Now, you're saying that that's a, a developmental issue, that they, they become more aware of their own identity, that they are separate individuals from their, from their parents, from their family. Well, I would say that if the uh, system that they have uh, grown up in uh, tolerates that, okay, some families uh, tolerate independence less than others. Okay. Mm -hmm. Some families, for whatever reason, uh, the way the parents were raised or the way they view the world, they view the world as a, as a suspicious place, uh, a place that's to be mistrusted. Uh, do they see themselves as um, maybe finding it difficult for some of the children to grow up? Mm -hmm. At the same time, from the point of view of the child, the child may have learned that the way to get uh, positive feedback and acceptance from their parents is to kind of do what they want. Mm -hmm. As a small child, everyone likes to say, oh, look how he listens. Isn't that wonderful? Sure. Uh, it's, it's wonderful how he minds me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, as you get to be a uh, teenager, uh, that doesn't work quite as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, it looks a little odd. You very rarely hear parents say, what a wonderful 16-year-old. He listens to everything I say. It would be unusual. Uh, he would be unusual, and he probably would be incurring other problems within himself, mm -hmm. which could be manifested as a kind of a depression or um, loneliness and ability to make friends. So what's important at that stage is that the individual is then reaching to the outside world. So they may not want to get as much self-gratification from pleasing their parents as they want to please themselves and possibly uh, deal with pleasing others outside of their home. This is part of the normal growing up process. But, but let, me, let me ask uh, Dr. Spiro a little bit about that terms of peer influences, one of the things that Dr. Moskowitz seems to be saying is at that stage in adolescence where uh, family forces, family influences may be less and less, peer influences become more and more important and that becomes a, a primary source of the child's identification. Is, is that part of the rebellion? It's actually a part that starts before middle school. Mm -hmm. In a sense, a kid in elementary school looks to their parents for positive feedback. Mm -hmm. As a child gets older, becomes an adolescent, they begin to look more toward their friends. Um, Erickson talked in a sense of a kid going through a process of industry versus inferiority, learning if they feel secure in themselves and what they're able to do and what they're not able to do. The next stage after that is identity versus identity diffusion, and that's where the child or adolescent at that point is beginning to form their own separate identity outside of the family, mm -hmm. whether it's sports, music, different hobbies, activities, or different places they just like to be. Mm -hmm. Now, can a child develop an identity within the family? I think of it in a sense as three separate identities. Really? One within the family, mm -hmm. one within their peer group, and one just within themselves. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. When, when would you say the process goes awry? When would you say re, re, a child's teenage rebelliousness is more than the norm, more than normal teenage rebellion? Um, well, Dr. you know, Mosley. I think these are the things that we see, uh, Mitch and myself, and people who do the kind of work that we do, is when things sort of get off the track of normal rebellion. Uh, now, if a teenager for some reason feels a need to call too much attention to himself and uh, start, starts getting into trouble, starts having school difficulties, uh, getting involved with drugs, uh, we, we were talking about, I, I think there's no clear-cut way to see this. We've both been talking about uh, individuality, developing, kind of trying to get more feedback, feedback from peers. There can be such a thing as over-identification with the peer group, mm -hmm. uh, seeking things from the peer group, uh, where that becomes the entire center of, your, of the world, even if the peer group is an entirely uh, negative influence. Okay, that is definitely not what you call a normal rebellion. It seems like that for many children, what, what happens is as they seek their own identity mm -hmm. and reject some of the values of their parents and still feel the need to fit in somewhere, and they don't feel that they fit into their family. They try somewhere else to fit in, and they find that they fit in within this peer group. And that may be some of the reasons be behind uh, the increase in gangs or the increase in uh, uh, children who feel susceptible to peer pressure. At least they're fitting into some group. They belong. There's a sense of belonging. 
here they are left out of the family since since they're 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 being they're rejecting to some extent some of their parents' values. Um, they still feel some sense of a need to to fit in somewhere. Well, the problem with that is I agree with what you're saying. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is what they really look to do is I think those specific kinds of children are another subgroup possibly uh, who did not have any positive uh, family development. Mm -hmm. Okay, these were not. Uh, children who've grown up in a normal, I would think, loving, caring, sort of nurturing family situation, and what they look to do is to provide their own family so that they can indeed receive uh, the kind of uh, love that they may have never gotten mm -hmm. in their growing up years. Okay, so that is another whole situation because those children never get what they're looking for. And, but they may be able to find on these peripheral on these peripheral societal groups, these, these uh, unusual peer groups? Well, what I'm saying is in those peer groups, they don't even get what they're looking for. They really? Just get in, no, because they just get into trouble. They're looking for love. They're looking for uh, the creation of a family. And uh, you can never artificially reproduce the types of things that you mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> feel you were denied when mm -hmm. you were in your very early growing up years. And that's why gangs are always getting into trouble. Uh, I, I had uh, the child, uh, well, it was a teenager, a call one time that we had to admit to a hospital for an emergency uh, evaluation who had taken an uh, overdose. Mm -hmm. And the reason she had taken the overdose, she took an overdose, um, her friends, a group of her friends, uh, she had planned a runaway with them to leave town. She was very close, had developed her own group. Well, these kids ran away without her. And when she got the news, she was so distraught, almost as if her, her own mother had left her, yeah. that she took an overdose. And then wow. she got scared and called her mother. So it was that she had gotten so little in terms of what she felt she needed from her own family. She was seeking it from this peer group. Mm -hmm. And that can be a very dangerous situation sometimes. Okay. It's uh, an unusual situation, though. I, I bet it's not totally unusual for some of our audience who may Maybe be listening, and, and I'd like to even catch that uh, question out to, to any of you who are listening. Um, if you'd like to give us some feedback on the topic of your own experiences with teenagers, um, give us a call here on the show, 995-2174. Um, let's say that it's not unusual. Let's say that that's, that's something that happens a lot. In some of the work that I've done with my with my work at the Family Center, I've seen um, a lot of teenagers who's, it almost, it almost seems to me to be a natural process of rejection of traditional family values. Like, I just don't want you to shove this down my throat anymore. I'm not a child. I'm an adult, even though they don't quite feel that they have all the rights of an adult. And I don't want you to tell me what to do anymore. I want to be respected as an adult. And the rebellion seems to take on that flavor, more of, uh, of a child wanting some kind of respect. And I, don't, I think that many parents don't quite know how to deal with that, and, and that they don't feel adequately prepared. Um, do you have any, any ideas, Mitchell, on, on how, to, how parents could uh, respond to their children, respond to their teenagers? See, even I, in my language, I'm using children. And see that you can see the, the difficulty mm -hmm. here that they might be suffering with, um, how they might be, be able to respond to their teenagers um, who say they want some level of respect. I think that's really one of the key issues, that adolescence these days starts in elementary school. And I think of it as drug, sex, and rock and roll before the kid is actually in middle school. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of look at it as an almost. Uh, a kid is almost old enough to drive, they're almost old enough to vote. They're almost old enough to do everything themselves, and yet the parents have total control. Yes. And I think Very it's really an issue of control at that point. Did they want some more control over their lives? In a sense, feeling their own sense of identity within the family and outside, but as though nobody can tell them what they should or shouldn't do. Uh, in a sense, breaking apart from even the part of their parent personality. Uh, they're very much into nurturing themselves at that point, rather than looking just for nurturance outside. Mm -hmm. And then, if not feeling good about themselves, they look for nurturance outside as well. Mm -hmm. um, even though, even though I, uh, I see many teenagers as wanting to have that control, I think that if they were given it, 
that they wouldn't know what to do with it. You know? An awful lot of kids are asking for limits. Um, one kid in group therapy said, uh, my parents don't care what time I come home. It doesn't matter at all. And another kid kind of perceptively said, what happens if you don't come home that night? Uh, won't there be anybody that will check on you? What if something really happens to you? Will they look for you? And he says, no, they just go to sleep. It's really cool. And gradually, the other kid began to say, you know, I wish they had some limit. Maybe after 3 o'clock, they would come looking for me instead of sleeping the night. want them to set some limits on Exactly. Sure. So I think the kids are asking for controls, and yet they're the ones that want to set the boundaries as far as what can I do, what can I not do mm -hmm. within the household. Mm -hmm. We were talking uh, a moment ago about some of the forms that the teenager, different teenagers may rebel. And I'm wondering if there's any data to, or any research on the different forms that a teenager might rebel, whether they choose uh, drug use or alcohol use or uh, a particular wild hairstyle or wild dress or violence. Or what, 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 what would predict the form that the rebellion takes? I think, I think it uh, stems a lot from the individual personality, uh, you know, of the uh, individual. Uh, some teenagers can rebel without even leaving their bedroom, okay? Uh, they can just uh, sort of withdraw, too. You know, that's called depression. Uh, some uh, teenagers don't have the wherewithal to go out and start engaging in different types of behaviors, okay? So they may even incur certain particular problems with their health, mm -hmm. all right? I mm -hmm. think that even some of the uh, eating disorder type things uh, right. that right. develop in early adolescence may be some form of uh, rebellion mm -hmm. uh, turned right. inward, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, these are, again, not normal types of things. So it's sort of the process of just sort of gets all twisted around. Uh, one kid may act out and may be able to go out and get himself into trouble. That's a function. He may be just a more of an outgoing type of a personality. Do you think that eating disorders are a form of teenage rebellion? Uh, it's what you call a very passive, passive aggressive, okay? Uh, mm -hmm. It's sort of inducing anger in others. Uh, it's, it's a very Frustrating them. Yeah, frustrating them because uh, those are children frequently, and I say children because they're teenagers who stay children. Those are uh, kids who get right up to adolescence, get right up to all of the uh, pubertable, pubertable, that's a tough word, isn't it? <laughs> they get right up against puberty, they look at it, and they say, I don't want any part of this. Uh, what scares them away? That scares them away is the outside world in adulthood and realizing... The responsibilities of adulthood? Well, they realize that they have made kind of a living as a child ingratiating themselves to adults, uh. and that's worked well for them. And uh, when they're you get out, to. that's what they're used to. And when they get out there with other kids, kids don't buy that. So it's basically a fear of the outside world, a fear of growing up. Wow. And also a sense of that they have no control, but then they focus on this thing called, uh, you know, their diet and their food and their eating. Sure. And uh, they can control that. Yeah, there may not well, be much I can control, but I can control what I put in my mouth. Right. And they can frustrate others, and no one, no one can defeat them. Yes. Yes, well, a very powerful method of, con of control in the home. Powerful and scary because it can be life-threatening, even yes. more so. Yes, that's true. Well, what, what do you see as the most common form of rebellion that you come across, uh, Dr. Sparrow? An awful lot of the kids that I work with are products of divorces. Mm -hmm. I think of a kid as going through a divorce as well. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about rebellion, what we're saying is that a kid is oppositional, stubborn, argumentative, provocative. Uh, there's a normal limit there also, but often in a divorced family or a step family, there's an adjustment process, uh, mourning that deals with the death of the previous marriage, um, issues that aren't resolved very quickly. The key here is recognizing that it's okay for a kid to see a therapist, to take the kid in for an evaluation and say, you know, you may not feel comfortable talking with a family member but there are boundaries, there are confidentiality limits. You can talk about anything here. As long as a kid's not a danger to themselves or to others, a psychologist or psychiatrist is bound by the confidentiality. Mm -hmm. In a sense, being able to keep everything just that within holds, those That holds walls. for teenagers, too. Even though it may be a teenager that's coming to see you, it's still strictly confidential, 
and the parents are not privy to that information? Generally, in working with a, an adolescent, I'll say to either him or her, I'd like you to tell me if there's something that specifically should not be shared with your parents. Okay. Uh, sometimes a friend has had an abortion. Another friend may have a drug problem. Often things that they've worried about, they want to provide some sense of help, but they're not sure how to go about doing so. Sure, sure. I'd like to uh, agree with Mitch about that and add that uh, I've seen, because I do office work and hospital work, so I have a sense of what the worst problems can be and what some of the easier problems are, mm -hmm. um, that a frequently neglected area is unresolved issues about divorce for children. The tremendous uh, sense of loss and anger towards both parents that is incurred by these children. People are busy in the process of divorce. Uh, the parents with their own grieving and mourning and getting on and getting on with their lives. And I think that uh, the kids are usually neglected uniformly. Mm -hmm. Parents think they're caring for them, but and the kids may not make it obvious, but um, it's an extremely hurtful, destructive process to children. Mm -hmm. I, I think another point to be made here is that the whole time period of adolescence and, and maybe childhood itself is shrinking. Okay, we, uh, it's becoming more compacted. You know, we, which way? Well, I, I'd say it's coming down. In other words, we tell kids, well, why don't you grow up? And then they start doing all these grown-up things uh -huh. like uh, running out and having sex. And then they say, well, don't act so grown-up. You're just a kid. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Uh, so everything is getting more compact. Um, also, I think we need to give a little bit more credence to this period called uh, childhood and adolescence and pay some, some time to it and give mm -hmm. it some you know, identify it as a meaningful period. I think as adults, we'll pay lip service to it and say, oh, this is the greatest period of your life. How can you have a problem? And I think this is very uh, hurtful to kids. Most kids are hurting a lot during their adolescence, mm -hmm. and they're not having such a great time. Mm -hmm. Adults have a lot more fun than kids do, <laughs> whether we want to admit it or not. Mm -hmm. We can do what we want to do. Sure. Sure, we don't have any of the limits that uh, the children do. Oh. And uh, I think if parents need to understand what their kids go through today, you know, we just come in and tell them to do things. Mm -hmm. But you got to take the time to kind of understand what the heck is going on with them in their world. Do you help your teenagers to understand that this is another period of your life? It's not just like an on-off, you're a child here and then you're an adult, but this is, there's this transitional period. Absolutely. And I think, I think it's, it's neglected. And I think you see that parents, uh, something that we talk about is parents raising children, but I think children also have to know how to raise parents. Um, and that's something that we talk about mm -hmm. in trying to get the kids involved in helping the parents understand, and parents have to be open to that. How, how, can, how can children help their parents to understand what they're dealing with, uh, Mitchell? Well, I think the first thing is being able to talk to a parent knowing that there won't be any consequences in a sense. If a Unconditional says, love. Is, and acceptance. And no matter what the child says, that they'll know that their parents are going to be willing to listen and not reject them. I want to tell you what happened last night. It's something I've been very worried about. It's something I've been a little bit afraid about. Mm -hmm. And being able to talk about it without fear of negative consequences. Gee, that's a tall order for a lot of parents. A lot of parents out there are saying, <coughs> there's no way I can just be completely open if my child comes in and says, well, well Dad, um, I went out last night and uh, I think that I went too far with this girl and she might be pregnant. Mm -hmm. And let's say this is a very rigid family. Uh, I won't mention any particular ethnic backgrounds, but let's say this is one that does not allow for any kind of premarital uh, sexual activity. Are they going to really be open you know, to that? Uh, that gonna but that's a difficult situation for any parent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think that we can start at an easier level, okay? What I'm saying is that um, if, a pa see, parents always feel they have to be parents, okay? If you hear something from your kid, if you're a good parent, you've got to give them a solution right then. You've got to give them an answer. You've got to redirect them. You've got to let them know what's right. And I think frequently do that turns kids off, okay? 
you, you may not get such drastic situations. You may just want to sit down and talk to your kid and saying, you know, what's going on? What do you do with your friends? Or uh, what are you interested in? Don't wait till a crisis to talk. Yeah, because what happens is when you have to get involved in a crisis, it's like you don't really have permission. You're not in. I think if you spend the time to invest, you'll get back that investment. And the investment is trying to spend some time getting to know your kid as a human being, as, as a person. Otherwise, you come in more as a policeman writing a ticket every time. And we know how we all feel about policemen writing us tickets. Mm -hmm. right. You know, we're not too right. pleased with that. Sure. And we don't have much sympathy for them. It's developing a level of mutual respect. That's, mm -hmm. that's something that mm -hmm. takes time and energy, and it's a process. It's not something that just occurs overnight. I think that the, the adolescents can respect their parents, but they some t si sometimes lose respect when they, when they see certain hypocrisies exactly. in parents, yeah. and they're able, at, they're cognitively aware at, at age 12, 13, 14, that there are certain inconsistencies in what parents say, so they may lose some respect for that, so parents may have to be careful to, to mean what they say and say what they mean. Right. Kids are just starting to be able to think abstractly, right. 11, 12, 13, and at that point, they can understand their world, and they're trying to understand their parents' world the way that they think. Mm -hmm. One of the keys here, I think, for all parents is recognizing that children and adolescents don't think of the same alternatives that an adult will. Sure. And helping the kid to express their problems, their alternatives, mm -hmm. and then open-mindedly saying, I have another alternative. You might consider a third one. Rule out one of yours. It might not work at all. Mm -hmm. This sounds, I, I'm going to play devil's advocate for a minute. Um, just because I think that there are some viewers out there thinking, well, that sounds easy, but tempers run high in the home and it's very difficult and if you think about uh, biochemical hormonal increases uh, during adolescence I can see how in certain families the dynamics may be such that tempers flare when they're when disagreements start um, is that more likely at adolescence or is that just a function of family dynamics I think it's definitely more likely during adolescence because the kid knows how to initiate an argument how to start an argument to detract the parent from the key issue. Um, well, they've learned how were, to pull their strings. Exactly. <laughs> and by doing so, they avoid a good amount of what the real issues are that they were arguing about. It becomes more of a bickering.